Hello, and welcome to Resolve, an after-play show. This is an after-show for a role-playing game that does not have an actual play, where we tell you all the details of our game so you don't have to listen to it. Hi, I'm Sammy, I'll be your host. My pronouns are she, her, and I play Asiri Amoli, the deep-sea mermaid, who also uses she, her. Joining me today is my wonderful co-host, Alex. Hi, I'm Alex. I play Moogle Avatar of Alexander Smog. Both of us use he, him pronouns. We are joined today by Carolyn! Hi, I'm Carolyn. I use she, her, hers pronouns, and so does my character, Pony with an I, the miniature horse, who is not, in fact, a unicorn. We are also joined today by Daniel! Hi, I'm Daniel. I use he, him pronouns, and I'm the game master for this campaign. All right, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Now that we're all here, Alex, why don't you tell us about the actual play? Previously, in a feat, Symphonius goes through a crisis of identity before resolving to train and face World Core another day. Smog wants to return to Sequence Chart to tailor outfits, but Tau confirms, through some communication with Aura, that the time dilation could make that difficult. Smog and Tau shop beach fashion on the boardwalk while Geyser, Pony, and Asiri continue to the scale. After clearing the bouncer, Pony and Geyser shop while Asiri notices Eupharo heading up an elevator. Worldcore reunites, assembles their outfits, and takes the elevator up. A bassoon judges their fashion on a catwalk, finds them wanting, and challenges them to a music battle. After a quick win for the party, the bassoon lets them pass on to the next floor, promising to put in a good word for them going forward. So now that you've heard the actual play, let's do a deep dive into the session. So Daniel notwithstanding, I would like to know what my fellow party members think of Symphonius in this moment. He's having a little bit of a breakdown. He strikes me as one of those gifted kids who was doing like great throughout <laughs> middle school and high school and he got all A's with barely ever studying. And then he hit his first semester of college and he got a D minus. And he spiraled a little bit. A little me. bit? <laughs> he makes me think of Fawful from the Mario and Luigi RPGs. Yes, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely does not remind me of Pokemon rivals, but Fawful is kind of an RPG rival. <laughs> I just wasn't expecting him to shrivel and collapse <laughs> so <laughs> dramatically. <laughs> yeah, he was acting very tough there for a while. Well, then also instantly recovering the second somebody (laughs) mentions the party secrets, he's like, ooh. (laughs) And then immediately reverting back to crying when we wouldn't give him what he wanted. (laughs) (laughs) What is going on? I wanted another larger-than-life personality who is so sure of themselves, but can't really handle opposition very well. He's kind of a mess. I (laughs) I wonder what Symphonius' training is even going to be i have ideas for what he could be doing in the meantime obviously this encounter is very much sticking with him the world core band here is pretty much stuck in his brain (laughs) (laughs) i want a training montage where he's eating a bunch of raw eggs and lifting weights (laughs) (laughs) i'm sure there's gonna be so many things that he tries in the interim to better himself so that he can try to best you guys next time. It's going to be the first one to figure out world travel on his own and just blast right into Sequence Charter, get all the secret intel on us. Oh man, that would be (laughs) hype. That's terrifying. Don't do that. (laughs) Pony, she's a knucklehead. She's big on rivals and she did offer to train with Symphonius. But now that I've had some time to think about it, I think it might be even funnier if Symphonius doesn't acknowledge Pony as a rival at all. <laughs> and Pony is trying to get something to work and battle between good and evil and all that. And he's just like, eh, no, I'm doing my own thing. Get out of my way. <laughs> it's so great that you mentioned that because it does kind of strike me If Symphonius was a character, they'd be a pretty good fit for a knucklehead as well. They seem like someone who charges right in, thinks a lot about heroism, (laughs) gives it his all. 
I don't know if this just went right over Symphonius's head, but Tao did make a good argument after we defeated them. The hero is good at defeating villains, and Symphonius is like, yeah, I'm the hero, I know that. And Tao's just like, well, since you didn't defeat us, we're not villains, right? <laughs> and that's probably a lot of the crisis of fame came from. Am I the baddie? Am I, am I the baddie? No, it is the children who are wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he's at the point of much introspection. He's focused on a short term right now. <laughs> is Symphonius capable of introspection? It's gonna take some doing. You gotta get through the meathead. Now I'm just imagining Symphonius with the head that's just a blob of ground beef. Oh no. <laughs> like, uh, like a ham shank? <laughs> no. Is that just what a series see sometimes? Some people, <laughs> people, yes. <laughs> yeah. But most people, no. She's not mindless. What about when Gizir is super duper hungry? Oh, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> like chicken. <laughs> Turn into fish. <laughs> I hope that Meadow World is just straight up cartoon land so we can have Looney Tunes gags like that be textual. <laughs> <laughs> Although I feel like a lot of people would have issues with the logic there. We're already having a lot of issues with characters rubbing up against video game logic. Yeah. I can't imagine that cartoon logic would be any better. No. <laughs> no, it won't. Geyser would probably vibe with cartoon logic the easiest. <laughs> Smog and Tau have been vibing with video game logic for quite a while. Smog maybe less knowingly so, <laughs> because I don't know if Smog knows he's in a video game or not. Yeah, Smog doesn't understand that. Tau probably also wouldn't understand that, but they're also from settings that would allow them access to video games. They probably know quite a bit about video games, even though they wouldn't understand they're from them-ish. <laughs> what video game is Smog the best at? <sighs> Style savvy. <laughs> <laughs> we confirmed that. <laughs> Literally, that's most of this session. <laughs> I try not to forget that Swag has an interest in fashion. <laughs> he's got a passion for fashion. Hell yeah. I mean, he's able to use that in this session. It came in very helpful when we were looking for clothes to wear. It was very fun. It seemed like it didn't amount to much, which I'm fine with. We purposefully did not pursue the best means possible, and I think that's funny. <laughs> Yeah, the people in the scale are pretty stuck up about fashion, so their arbitrary blown-off standards are quite high. <laughs> I personally struggled a lot with this session because Asiri doesn't wear clothes. <laughs> There's no reason it's nonsensical for her to wear clothes. I always try to be a yes-and role player instead of being like, no, I don't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so I was trying to find a compromise in the middle somewhere and I was like, okay, I guess we can do like some accessories, but I was just like, I don't I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing here. <laughs> I don't go up here. <laughs> are there no like a special accoutrement for people who are in different roles in a serious society? Not really. Most of it is either just by title or size orientation. Hmm. I don't think there's a lot of stuff to make that with, and everything that is there is probably alive. <laughs> <laughs> Which seems a little cruel. It was food, it was food. Yeah. It will be food. Yeah. Yeah, I guess they got like a bunch of bones down there. But then you're taking from the Ossidax worms, which is wrong and rude. Yeah. If you want to use a seashell as like a ring or a necklace or something, you're taking away a home from a hermit crab. Exactly. So valid. A series a society leans a little bit more on the animalistic side. Yes, they are creatures. They would find such objects more as like hindrances. Yes. The way their general body plan in my head is clothes directly interrupts breathing via gills. So it's very frustrating for me to be like, hmm, let's put a dress on this. No, because then pumping doesn't work right. <laughs> you always gotta pump right. You gotta pump right. What about Pony? Pony seemed to have a very direct idea of what they wanted out of this fashion trip. Oh, absolutely, yes. You guys would not believe the amount of horse accessories I have seen in my lifetime. <laughs> it's phenomenal. You know what? I think I would believe Carol. <laughs> <laughs>
Before the session started, I was going back and forth with like what I wanted Pony's style to be and if I wanted to give her any accessories beforehand. And on one point, I was like, why not give the horse the cowboy hat because she is her own cowboy. But then it was like, nah, she wouldn't keep that in the woods as she's foraging and looking for magic. This was the perfect opportunity to get a rhinestone cowboy hat. And she looks so good. I haven't drawn her or anything, but like in my mind, <laughs> she has the hot pink hat with the light pink and white crystals on it. I genuinely like what you guys came up with. It, they gave such a clear mental image in my mind of how everyone looked. <laughs> I like to imagine especially Smog and Tao coming from their little beach shopping trip with their new duds. It is <laughs> delightful. I love thinking about Tao carrying the giant bags of clothes because Smog <laughs> realizes he cannot carry all of that without using magic. It's a little guy. <laughs> He's just a small little slice of cheese. Like, he can't <laughs> carry that much. He's just a gram. <laughs> I kind of wish D was here because I'm deeply curious why the hell she picked the outfit that she <laughs> did for <laughs> Geyser? Black, clean cut suit, black tie, white undershirt. And then a creepy mask. <laughs> a nondescript, unmarked, undesigned, white masquerade mask. <laughs> yeah, at first I thought it was a Guy Fox mask, and then I looked closer and it was like, mm, no, that's not quite it. <laughs> Basically featureless, yeah. This is spooky spirit Halloween shit. It's interesting because Geyser is such a design detailed character, and for them to flip to something faceless like that, it's strange. Black and white instead of rainbow colors, too. Because even when Geyser disguised themselves as a hyper contrabass flute, they were still rainbow. They kept the rainbow. In this case, they decided to go all black and white, just monochrome. Does Geyser think rainbows are unfashionable? No, Geyser. Yeah, it's probably an attempt to fit into the style that she heard about. But what's funny is that Geyser did not immediately go with Pony in a series. She decided to stick with Tao and Smog for a bit and go shopping. And then that's the idea for an average ad. And Smog is like, well, you could probably have a better chance getting that with Siri and Pony. And she's ran off. <laughs> Later. Had a copy of the design on her tablet to show Pony and Asiri. <laughs> I don't know why we broke the party the way we did, because Pony and Asiri might be the worst two people to give fashion advice, and you sent them alone <laughs> to go shopping. <laughs> now, to be fair, Pony has had to wear her share of silly outfits, so she is well accustomed to the idea of clothes. That's fair, but does Pony keep up with all the latest trends coming from far, far away? Oh, absolutely not. <laughs> far, far away, deep, deep in the woods. Smog and Tao would be the most fashion-conscious characters, and we were like, let's put them in silly beach duds. <laughs> <laughs> let's dress them up like Jimmy Buffett. <laughs> <laughs> Wasting away again in Margaritaville. Because I'm sure everybody is dying to hear, I can describe Smog's temporary outfit core here is that there is a tie-dye tank top, but there are undyed sections in the center to make it look kind of like an equalizer because there has to be a music theme to all the clothes. And then has a patterned shirt over that with the sleeves rolled up. Denim shorts and pink flip-flops. He doesn't have the hood on anymore, so you can see his hair is a little bit longer and a little less pink. Do Moogles in this form have the bunny feet? Like, I'm trying to imagine how a flip-flop would work on that. I can't remember if Ivelisse Moogles ever show feet. <laughs> so I, we'll leave that up to the listener's imagination. Oh, no. <laughs> show feet. Show feet. <laughs> We're just going to look up Ivelisse Moogles and see what I can get. <laughs> Yeah, I think they're like always wearing boots, but they don't seem to have very large feet. And we've designed Smog in a somewhat interesting way where he still has like the very chunky rabbit leg, which uh, Evilly Smoogle sometimes and sometimes do not have because yeah. some of them are wearing higher boots. And especially in like uh, tactics art, they seem to not. But in Final Fantasy XII more so, they do have chunkier pants that belie chunkier legs. So I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> the question is down to which world he is in, I suppose. Ooh, that's the correct answer. <laughs> 
I forget what Tao was wearing. I know they were wearing, like, red, bright-ass Crocs. Zach decided to go with the design I fed last time. Tube top and cargo shorts. Right. Um, but also, in addition to the Crocs, adding a, I think, baseball cap, right? Some sort of hat that the horns are poking through. Yeah. Oh, I remember it being a straw sun hat. Okay. That makes a little more sense. I think I lost audio there for a sec. So it's like, I hear a hat. <laughs> I assume it's a baseball hat. That's also good. I think you described it as normcore. <laughs> <laughs> Love to see it. I don't. I think it was successful in that regard. <laughs> it gave me garden mode. Garden mode? Hat. Garden mode. Very normcore garden mode. <laughs> Imagine a rhythm farming game. Well, the farming sim, baby. Let's go. <laughs> A rhythm farming game would be pretty good. A rhythm farming game. Let me see if this exists. Yeah, you gotta like smash the produce at a certain time. I'd like to imagine dancing carrots with that. Sorry to derail the entire podcast. Lesbian farming rhythm game, Seeds of Love. I love you. All right, so we have a plug for this week. <laughs> uh, Save that to your Steam wish list. <laughs> Jesus Christ, there's multiple examples. A prehistoric rhythm game and farming sim, Roots of Pacha. And then somebody who seems to be in the middle of designing this, but I don't know when this video is from. A year ago, so maybe this game is out by now. Who knows? Wild. A <laughs> new subgenre that we discovered. <laughs> we did it. We found out what the meta world's going to be like. Oh, no. Are there any more details of the clothes we didn't talk about? Tony also got a pair of shades, but they're regular black Ray-Bans. Right, Smog has aviators now to go with the beach outfit. Oh, that's oh so and cool. she still has her little plush headphones she won at the carnival last session, or the session before that. So she is decked out. Siri had like a starfish necklace and glass bracelets with glow sticks inside of them, yes? Yes, because Smog kept shoving glow sticks inside the bracelets. And the series like, I glow already. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's everybody's outfit heading into fashion check. These are people with very particular tastes. It would be hard, regardless, to please the bassoon, who is at the lowest level of the pagoda. They're there to try to push out as many people as possible from scaling the pagoda higher. Pony and a series gimmick probably caught the most attention. <laughs> So what would gimmick? Because <laughs> we didn't talk about that. Yeah, for context, that gimmick being to cut out the lights at an opportune moment and have Isiri illuminate Pony so that light reflects off Pony's hat and made like a disco ball. It was a pretty impressive move. Yeah. A series familiar with displays, however, her displays don't work in light. So she was like, let's just darken the room. Let's get a nice, cozy, reminding feeling of home for a second. And then Pony's got, like, this crazy-ass hat on. So she's like, hey, that looks pretty sparkly. I bet I could do something with that. <laughs> and laser light show impromptu. It was kind of fun. For a minute there, before they walked down the runway, I thought Asiri was going to fake ride Pony, where she would float in her bubble above <laughs> Pony. And it would look like that one boss from Elden Ring, the one with the really, like, thin <laughs> horse. <laughs> the guy has no feet. Oh my god. <laughs> Isn't there like a Bokoblin that rides a little pig somewhere in Zelda 2? That sounds correct. Yeah. I don't think Asiri would do that because I think Asiri and Pony have discussed how Pony's sensitive about people riding her before. <laughs> so. They have, but it's for fashion. And <laughs> I think she's at the point where she trusts Asiri enough where if Asiri were to say, hey, I know you hate this, but can we do it for the bit? She'd <laughs> Really do it for her. Like she'd huff and puff and say, Oh, really? This is so pedestrian. People have seen a horse being ridden before, but then she'd do it. <laughs> no, what if Pony got to ride a series? I was about to say that. <laughs> yeah. That's the only way this goes. That just looks silly because a series is so big. <laughs> Pony is so small and a series is so huge. Pony could like be a series hat and then Pony would be wearing a hat. So it would be a hat on a hat. Write that down. We're doing that when we go up the elevator. <laughs> That's exactly what you want in fashion is a hat on a hat. Yes. 
I have considered when we go up just being invisible and see if I can sneak by to the leader. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That's a classic smog move. Go in, go, you know. the cheeky moogle. Cheeky moogle. Goodbye. <laughs> Goodbye. Smog's pretty good at sneaking. Yeah. Did that this world too. Secret agent Smog. Ooh. Yeah, he was a bounty hunter. He had to <laughs> go through some complicated situations. Learned a bit from that. <laughs> it's complicated. <laughs> what are your guys' thoughts on Eupharo being there? I just want to know why the bassoon was like, yeah, you can pass, even though there's very clearly some sort of animosity here. Like, why did, <laughs> yeah. why did you look them up if you don't like them? Like, yeah, sure, they may have passed whatever check beforehand, but that doesn't mean you get to you can kick people out of the store, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Not if they're fashionable. But he said that they were outdated. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's the kind of outdated that's like, yeah, it's a suit. It's classic, but uh, eh, there's better stuff you could wear. It just sounded like they were doing their job, and <laughs> they didn't want to have someone tell them for not doing their job. <laughs> I can understand that, working customer service. True. I don't know, man. I want to know what's going on with you, Pharaoh, because apparently people do not like that. <laughs> <laughs> You have the society that's just like, yeah, we have to do everything to be number one and be the best performer. And then it sounds like Eupharo figured out a way to get that attention and then people are pissed about it. What's the truth? <laughs> At least I've been under the impression for most of the time that these people don't seem to be questioning the state of their world. But if people are upset at Eupharo, maybe they're a little more introspective than I gave them credit for. Yeah, this place is kind of abstract but with a grounded exterior, they channel the spirit for being number one, being on top, being seen by everybody through what they find is fundamentally important, which is performing music. It just feels weird, maybe because I'm not from a video game world, I hope, <laughs> that everyone is just so diehard on, like, you gotta be the top. There's clearly other activities in this world other than just <laughs> performing. There's the carnival. There's the beach. There's apparently building really high-tech pagodas. There's these other occupations. Why is performance the thing you have to be best at that everyone's like in agreement on, regardless of the other skills that are present here? You have to ask, why can't people just perform music for the sake of performing music, too? Which is what Siri asked. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Which Tao did at the end of the music battle. Tao was just like, I'm having fun with all the fans. I'm going to keep playing music. We didn't sit in that too long, but like, what would their reactions have been? Did they like people just performing music for the sake of it? Was it weird to not see it in the context of a battle? They would have probably interpreted that action in a different way. Maybe if they were really stuck in the mindset that's aligned with the general populace, they might have seen that as a victory lap of some sort. But I don't think everyone is necessarily homogenous either. So mm -hmm. there may be some who also just appreciated the aspect of performing music for the sake of it. I guess this is back a ways a little bit, but before we get to the scale, Pony and Asiri have a very quiet conversation as we're traversing however long the distance is between the beach and the scale. How does Pony feel about that interaction? At the beginning, she did not pick up what Asiri was putting down. <laughs> She saw a worried look on Asiri's face, and she immediately piped up, Oh, don't worry, Asiri. I'm sure we can find something in your size. <laughs> she was completely focused on getting some sweet new clothes. I love that. But that does miss the mark, unfortunately, where Asiri's mindset was. And she's worried a lot about the state of her affairs and what's going on with her physically. Through this adventure, she's gained a lot of potential and abilities that just aren't typical to what she has seen and expects of her people. And it's a little frightening for her. She's not used to magic, I guess. Yeah, not in the context that I guess Pony and most other people would understand it. She doesn't understand that you and I would consider making shadow illusions as magic, but for her that's just part of her existence. But summoning a dolphin through a portal is not part of her existence. That's usually not <laughs> very typical. 
I think the heart to heart was pretty sweet, and now they're even better friends. Yeah, I like how Ponyu is just like, oh, you're getting better, that's all. It's okay. She's gaining skills. Does Pony believe everything in black and white extremes? Because at the end of that conversation, you're just like, yeah, so long as you use your newfound abilities for good, then in a series like, well, you can't really make such distinctions between good and evil. They don't exist. And then she's like, this is grim. I gotta stop talking about this. <laughs> She kind of does. She knows enough that she thinks maybe there are nuances. She's maybe breaking out of it a little bit, but she is definitely coming from a place of people are mostly good or bad. So it should be easy to determine which ones are which depending on what they do. She hasn't really had an experience where someone had to do a bad thing for a good reason. That's probably something Smog could talk about at some point. <laughs> <laughs> How many bad things Smog has done? <laughs> some of them for good reasons. <laughs> How did Pony feel about being forced into a musical battle this time? Because the dance floor was summoned and we had to spend a link to get out this time if we wanted to, instead of spending a link to join. She decided to not spend the link to get out. She decided to just fight it. And she didn't love it, but music battles are difficult for her because she hates feeling like she has to perform, but she loves to fight and she loves attention. She just only loves certain kinds of attention. In that instance, because she didn't have the option to opt in, only to opt out, she felt like it was more of an attack, therefore more of a fight than a performance. She also helped everybody with bass, so. That's true. <laughs> yeah. She's very good at harmonizing. Or at least I've gotten very lucky, knock on wood, rolling when I want to harmonize. <laughs> Pony is the backbone of this group. <laughs> what say you, Daniel? Yeah, that was almost entrapment with the music battle. It was spurred on by a series action <laughs> with the bassoon. A series didn't really know what the bassoon was talking about when offering critiques about y'all's fashion, and then a series picked up the bassoon. To be fair, the bassoon was like, "I want to be elevated," and a series like, "Okay, <laughs> <laughs> I can do that for you if you'd like." <laughs> I'm pretty sure the pursuit said, I want your fashion to be elevated. <laughs> Siri is like, I'm just going to pick up this fool. And Siri is a selective listener. <laughs> a little selective, I think. Whatever is the most literal and whatever is funnier. <laughs> <laughs> the bassoon was not very great at music fights. His job is to turn 90% of people away. And they were coming off of a really long day. So like, if I can't love your fashion, then I'm going to have to see how you do in a fight. You guys kicked their ass. <laughs> Handily. There are some really powerful movements in that. Uh, something I do want to call out is that we established that the village people are planeswalkers. Yes. <laughs> For some reason. But I guess it makes sense. There are from all walks of life, I guess. <laughs> and I guess that means from every realm. <laughs> Tao is trying to point out that they could just follow the theme of the name and have very different designs for their outfits because Smug was worried about the cohesion of the group fashion and then Tao referenced the village people and then Geyser and Pony seemed to know about them as well. <laughs> <laughs> Interdimensionally known. This will have to be a question for Aura, I think, when we get back. <laughs> Did you know village people? <laughs> I have to dive deep in the archives. <laughs> I believe that they've been included in anything in Final Fantasy, so there's no reason for Smog to know about them. <laughs> Smog does know village people. People in villages. Yes, <laughs> yes those, those have definitely been in Final Fantasy. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of Aura, I just love that conversation that Tao had with Aura. Uh, Aura's oh, yes. <laughs> working on some sort of large teleportation arch project. Mini Tao pops up and starts talking to them, even though they just saw them walk through the portal not that long ago. <laughs> oh yeah, at the beginning of the session, after we tried to console Symphonius before we got clothes, Tao was like, oh, should we go back to Sequence Charter for supplies? And then we were like, eh, split. Who all wanted to stay in this world and who wanted to go back? Because Pony wanted to stay. She just felt like 
why even bother going if I'm just going to come back? See, I wanted to go back because I like mixing up scenes. I thought that would have been fun just to see the time dilation a little bit because I think that's <laughs> interesting. <laughs> to force Dan to deal with the time dilation. Yeah, <laughs> if you're going to incorporate time travel shenanigans, I'm going to expressly use the time travel shenanigans. <laughs> also, a series just has things to do on Sequence Charter 2. <laughs> she can wait. She's patient. Yeah, Smog was the one who made the initial push to go there because nobody has costume change as a move. So <laughs> we had to spend narrative time gathering things, and it just seemed like that would be easier to do the place where people like us and are basically <laughs> willing to give us any resources we want. <laughs> Maybe not any resource, but a majority of them, certainly. Sega's Charter has its limits, but you guys are one of the things they see as a solution to actually returning to Earth and not being on a planet that was destroyed by a moon. <laughs> Pretty high value of work that you're doing. I don't know that we've made a requisitions ask that they have completely rejected yet. Right. So far, everything has been fairly reasonable, especially now that you guys have helped them attain pretty huge amounts of resources through salvaging an entire vessel. It balances out pretty well, I would say. They have their internal limits, but it's not something that you guys have really come up against, because I'd say the circumstance, everyone's pretty cohesive right now, so resources are pretty readily transferable. We haven't had to deal with splitting the party through heavily dilated time that much. The only time I can think of is when Assyrian Smog went back to Sequence Charter while everyone else was still in the world of spirit. But even then, that was fairly brief. Yeah, because Smog and Assyria spent so little time, we had basically equal time in scenes because other people were doing longer term actions that could be described quickly. Yeah, and if I remember correctly, World of Spirit didn't have a lot of time dilation, if any. It's just that following like the World of Ages and then whatever transpired through the configuration was quite a massive jump. I just think it's interesting that the time dilation for the World of Song is so short. Yeah. Well, they've been gone for 10 minutes, but in the World of Song, it's been at least several hours. I don't know if it's more or less interesting to talk about my rationale behind that. I do want to hear this. For each of the worlds, they function a certain way. That affects how time flows in that world versus the world of what's supposed to be our alternate history universe, the world of the Sequence Charter and the planet Crassalis. So for the world of Song, time passes by in Sequence Charter when you guys are in music battles. Song's taking about two to three minutes each, cumulating with the few that you've done already results in about 10 minutes going by, whereas the rest might be on the scale of microseconds, computer cycles, that sort of thing. So you're saying if we want to speed run the world of Song, we just got to avoid every fight. Let's say you left and then went back in and like you didn't do any music fights and then went back out again. Practically not at all would have passed. All right. So, okay. so any percent world of Song <laughs> speed run completion. Yeah. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> this is interesting. This is even more motivation for Pony to not participate. <laughs> If we wanted to be just real little shitheads, like I've thought about this and thought about this as a smog even, could just go right to the pyramid. We could yeah. go there if we wanted to. However, yeah. I feel like something about Eupharo is important there that will help reveal the world core. We might need to visit the world of the lost again before we get the core here for some reason. I don't know for sure that speeding right to the pyramid is useful. And I've tried to make this version of smog be a little bit more about the journey. Yeah. <laughs> Plus, I personally, I'm just very curious to see, A, what Eupharo's business here is anyway. Why the hell are they here? B, I feel like if we just confront them at the pyramid, that's probably where they are the strongest. So I'm like, if we're going to do anything, we might as well do it when they're not at, ho at the home field advantage. You know? <laughs> do anything? Do you mean kill them? <laughs> like, no, I'm not suggesting we that's kill them. So but Siri would never funny. do that. <laughs> There's no way you have to go. You could skip all of these things if you wanted to. It's completely open, but I am glad that you guys are at least taking the time to look at some of the different locations, because I wanted to have a place with more smaller destinations in it, separate hotspots that you can go between, because we haven't had really any of those. And yeah, in character, we wouldn't be doing our jobs if we just 
rush to get the world cores because yes, we're supposed to be getting those, but we're also supposed to be creating a cultural connection to sequence charters. So it's important that they have some information about the worlds and not just you're connected now. Have fun. <laughs> Go nuts. <laughs> Figure your shit out. <laughs> I'll run with ramifications of whatever you guys do. <laughs> no. I think that's my job. I want everyone to be happy, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> this is 100% best timeline, not an any percent worst timeline. <laughs> I think Smog's already seen the any percent worst timeline. <laughs> I like that idea of Smog internally like having seen so many worse versions of how things could go is gently trying to help everyone go along to a version that doesn't go catastrophically wrong so it's i've like, seen how this actually works please listen to my advice <laughs> <laughs> no no don't don't quite do that let's just go over here so we don't have everything crash and burn does smog feel like that's a big responsibility for them it's difficult to put Smug in that position, really. There's a trust he has of everyone from them telling him the bits he knows about things going well. And then there's a trust in himself because they say that he was a part of it. He's not cocky, but a little too assured of all the information he's been given. Now, there's always a possibility that him being here leads them to a different timeline. Things could go awry, but hopefully not too far off. That's why he was really scared of the implications of Tao at first, because what does it mean that he doesn't remember them? But they seem to be doing well and not a problem so far. That's good. I was just about to ask, what is the opinion of Tao today? <laughs> Tao's just such an agreeable person. It's hard to be mad at them for too long. I really enjoy the way Tao provides helpful suggestions to people. <laughs> Especially when it's up to Tao to point out the obvious to someone, like, maybe from one of these worlds who just, like, doesn't get it. <laughs> Tao is the most likely person to talk to someone and rightfully treat them as a child if they're playing the role. Yeah, Smog tries to meet people on their own terms now more a little bit, but I, I think there was something here where he asked Symphonius, like, do you not understand the hero's journey? <laughs> You're supposed to fail, dummy. <laughs> <laughs> I just did not get it. Oh, it's hard for specifically a character like Synthphonius. Synthphonius is not getting a lot of things right now. They heard what Smog said. They're trying to do something as a response to it. But did they actually learn something from this encounter? <laughs> Probably not. Probably not. Yeah. They didn't, might be taught a lesson again. Yeah, Asiris is like, after Symphonius leaves, am I socially inept? And the answer is yes, Asiris is socially inept. But Tao is just like, no, I think they won. <laughs> <laughs> Symphonius has mostly a one-track mind, so they uh, got a little bit of that ineptitude. <laughs> He's running around with a cape. <laughs> <You're> like, hey. <laughs> Uh, now, not not to not to make a slight against people who run around with capes, but all I want to say is that he has a really strong idea who he is right now, and that might need to change. There is a statement that a cape makes, and you don't need to make it. And if you're a superhero, do not get caught in things flying, please. <laughs> what do you guys think is on the next floor? Like we're expecting another catwalk, probably. But what criteria do you think? they're looking for as we ascend up the scale, huh? Is it a Dorian scale? Is it a chromatic? I don't know about fashion or music to answer this question. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm wondering if it's somebody who will be a little more critical and not judging on the initial look as much, like somebody who will dig our concept that we're going for here with the different outfits, because yes, it's not a lot of effort on its face, but everything's put together when you examine it a little bit more and mm -hmm. it is trying to make a statement it is not actually mindless even though it is lowbrow <laughs> maybe we're gonna be so lowbrow it like breaks the counter and we go like high set back into highbrow again oh overflow overflow <laughs> syntax errors that's definitely a thing in fashion that's why everybody who has so much money has only basics <laughs> either basics or the ugliest shit i've ever seen in my life <laughs> Basics that I should say cost a hundred times what basics should. Yes. I thought it would be fun that you could shop the clothes that are going to be like super cheap. They're going to be mostly beach duds or like stuff that you could get at like a touristy location. 
when people wanted to shop new stuff at the scale, there's going to be some of that quote fashionable stuff, but it's just going to be so overpriced. Yeah, that's why basically three items came from the scale, the mask, the suit, and the hat, and then absolutely everything else was beachwear. <laughs> Hell yeah. What would you guys have done differently? No regrets for me this time. <laughs> <gasps> no regrets session. That's fantastic. Dan, do you have regrets? <laughs> I don't know what I could have done differently. I would have liked to get to the top of the scale that session, but we had some really good conversations. We had some really good explorative roleplay. I think the only thing I really would have changed is I would have added an accessory to Pony's tail because she's very front heavy in terms of clothing right now. She has her sunglasses. She has her hat. She has her headphones around her neck. And that's all in good for up front. But there's nothing in the back, maybe like a bow in her tail or something like that. I was thinking something more like weave throughout, like a glitter, some sort of like band that you could pull through it or just like literally tossing glitter in there. Or ribbons. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or clips. Clips. Oh, oh but- butterfly clips. Hell yeah. Mm-hmm. That's a minor enough change that you could spend a link to do a minor retcon if you wanted to do that. I don't know. That might be feasible. Spend a link to change my clothes. You're right. Yeah. It's a small change. Perhaps. I don't know. I'll think on it. Yeah. I don't have a ton of regrets either. I do think it would have been funny if I did one of the things I suggested outfit-wise. Trash queen, (laughs) just wearing (laughs) the great Pacific garbage patch. (laughs) But... (laughs) A Siri going as a green PSA. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. When you suggested that, Zach and I were like, I guess we accidentally grabbed a bag of trash. (laughs) (laughs) And then nobody had the heart to tell a Siri that wasn't actually close. (laughs) (laughs) All right, let's get into the resolution phase, the segment of the show where we each get to say something about the game with no responses. What is your final say on this session, Daniel? You all are climbing the scale and climbing closer to the world core. I don't have any social media, so you can find me by going into a language chatbot and saying, have a conversation with me, then we can talk all you want. Amazing. All right, what are your thoughts, Carolyn? Once Pony understands the concept of musical scales, it is over for those hoes. I also do not have social media, but you can find me in a couple of weeks after I reemerge from my hovel once the new Zelda game, Tears of the (laughs) Kingdom, comes out. (laughs) And for you, Alex? Maybe one day you should consider letting your rabbit dress you. You can find me on Twitter at Shining Crobat. This week, I recommend checking out Jury Duty. It is on Amazon's freebie. It is somewhere between a scripted and a reality show. There is one person who does not know that he is basically on a scripted show. He believes that he is in uh, Jury Duty, serving with James Marsden, and then a bunch of other people who... He doesn't understand her actors. Spoiling a little bit of the first episode, but they exploit that idea of fame attracting people to sequester the jury and have a roommate slash workplace comedy thing going on throughout. (laughs) It's very well done. It is kind to the one person who doesn't understand what's going on, especially at the end. And it's not too long. And it is free. It is ad supported. You do not have to buy anything from Amazon to watch it. And for myself... Siri's feeling great because she has the ability to use scales and her scales. You can find me by completing the blood pact ritual at your local church. Honey, that's just communion. (laughs) 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 Oh no. There it (laughs) ain't. No, I'm coming there. This has been Resolve, an afterplay show. You can find us online at most social media sites at Resolve AP. Except Instagram, which is at Resolve Afterplay. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. You can buy the game we're playing, Interstitial, Our Hearts Intertwined, from its creator, Riley Hopkins, at linksmithgames.com. All links will be included in the episode description. Thank you again for listening. We end our turn here, so now it's your turn. Tell us what's happening in your game. 